It is a FDP. Uh, I have uh, init I have just uh, given the brief outlines of uh, antenna, how it can be act as sensor. And before going to that, um, we will discuss about some antenna parameters, which is very much important for uh, working with antenna sensors. Uh, so let me share the screen first. So is the screen visible? Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Uh, okay, and I am, I am audible also, no? Y yes, sir. Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, the talk is on, on planar antennas and useful sensor. Uh, so here in this uh, uh, session, we ha I have just tried to uh, give a brief outline how antenna can be acted as sensor. Uh, and before going into that, we need to know in a very thorough way uh, some other subjects because antenna is a different type of sensor which we generally see uh, in our market the sensors which are available so uh, these are different kind of sensor and as it is a wireless equipment antenna is a wireless equipment so uh, the sensing through uh, antenna so it is a bit different from them so uh, that is why whenever we will try to work with antenna sensor we need to know uh, the basic parameters of antennas also. Many of you know the, these things, but who are uh, means who want to work in uh, antenna as a sensor, um, then, uh, but not uh, specifically in the field of antenna, they have to uh, know those parameters also. So keeping uh, this in our view, uh, we are, I have uh, tried to uh, prepare the slide um, with a very short time. I do not know how much uh, you will get from it anyway. So let's start this planar antennas. This is a useful sensor, how we can see. So before going to that, uh, first, first we need to know what is an antenna. So antenna is basically a system which radiates or receives electromagnetic wave. Uh, and its less popular name is radiator. It senses electromagnetic wave, okay. So in that sense, uh, from a very uh, rough way, we can think that as it is sensing some electromagnetic wave, it can be told as sensor. So uh, some people tell this antenna as a sensor because it can sense the electromagnetic wave. Uh, however, it is uh, not, uh, I am not uh, uh, very much agreed with that because uh, antenna is mainly, I think it is for uh, broadcasting and radiation purpose. But um, this antenna to act as a sensor, we need to do some different mechanism, all right? So uh, this is the first thing and radiator or antenna is basically the an electrical conductor or system of conductors where two modes are there. One is transmission mode where the, it radiates electromagnetic energy to space and another mode is that that is the reception which collects electromagnetic energy from space. In two-way communication the same antenna can be used for transmission and reception. Then what is an antenna sensor? Uh, the antenna sensor, when the radiator is used, when this antenna is used to sense some physical change of thing, anything, a physically, physical change of anything. So if my antenna, if the radiator can sense it, then I will call it as antenna sensor. Otherwise not. Because antenna is what I said in your previous slide that um, antenna is mainly useful for uh, means the um, ubiquitous uh, use of uh, this antenna is basically for broadcasting, transmitting, receiving purpose. But uh, it can be a useful sensor that is also a new area. And uh, uh, many cases, the antenna sometimes people uh, tells it as a transducer because uh, it changes the electrical signal to the wireless signal means electromagnetic wave. Um, so sometimes it is uh, called as transducer also. 
So the charge, uh, the, the change in transmission and reception signal, when the antenna is used as a sensor in the first point, as I said, that uh, when uh, some physical changes of thing can be uh, sensed through my antenna, then antenna is basically an antenna sensor. So change in transmission and reception signal may be useful to detect those physical changes. So usually two antennas will be required uh, when we will use the antenna as a sensor. Uh, sometimes with single antenna also the sensor uh, work can be done. Uh, and in this scenario, the planar antennas are very good. So before going to planar antennas, we will see some basic parameters. Mm, now, what I said, change in sensing of electromagnetic wave between transmission and reception uh, also includes the radio wave propagation effect. When you are trying to sense some signal wirelessly, um so you are transmitting certain signal uh, it is getting it is uh, getting reflected from an object which you want to sense and then um, it is uh, coming back to your again same antenna so at the time the transmitted signal and the received signal their difference the received power transmitted power their difference and bear the signature of what type of subject what type of uh, object is there Okay, so for that, therefore, you can understand from the story that for, to work with antenna sensor, we need to know well the three subjects that is antenna theory, radio wave propagation, and electromagnetic waves. So, uh, because whenever the signal is going to the some object and getting reflected back, so it encounters different medium when it is propagating wirelessly. So, the radio wave propagation effects the loss factors. So these are very much important. At the same time, electromagnetic uh, theory is also important because the effect of whenever you are trying to see some object, uh, it's a dielectric constant, etc. It varies with frequency, it varies with uh, different things, different facts. So these all things are very much we should know uh, to work with antenna sensor. So uh, in this session, uh, I am trying to um, uh, cover the basic antenna features which is required to work with antenna sensor and uh, different antenna parameters we need to uh, know very well uh, and uh, means the important parameters which is basically um, your uh, reflection coefficient, your um, uh, radiation pattern and the radiation factors. So those things are very much important. And actually the physical changes may be reflected in change of the antenna parameters. Means I mean to say, whenever some physical changes to be sensed, so it will be reflected in those antenna parameters. So antenna parameters you should know well. And those parameters, if you do not well, you cannot work with that. And uh, when the, because of some physical changes, the antenna parameters changes. Uh, so how much antenna parameter change? So depending on that, you can predict, you can calibrate that how much physical change has been uh, happened. So these are the, some example of basic antennas. For example, here dipole antenna, uh, monopole antenna is also there. Uh, you can see this is a dipole antenna, this is a monopole antenna, this is a, a monopole antenna with ground radials and a lock periodic antenna, dish antenna, loop antenna. This loop antenna with ferrite core and this is a, another lock periodic antenna. Uh, this is a Niagi antenna. Uh, so these things are there. These are the basic antennas. Uh, helical antennas are also there. This is a very important antenna, uh, mainly um, useful for circular polarization, which can take care of the Faraday rotation in the upper atmosphere. And this is the, some planar antennas. Um, now, horn antenna, you all know that is the useful um, for feed of a dish antenna. Uh, this is used as a, uh, but it, it can be used as transmit, it can be used as transmitting antenna for uh, sensor structure. Uh, but uh, this horn antenna creates a shadow on the aperture of parabolic dish. So in order to avoid that uh, shadowing effect, we need to miniaturize the antenna. And this miniaturization can be possible if we go for the printed antennas. Different printed antennas are there. <coughs> of that, 
the most reliable geometries are the rectangular and circular microstrip patch antenna whenever uh, the, any uh, industry try to use uh, some uh, antenna uh, then uh, the well established geometry they try to use that is why circular and rectangular patches these are very much important uh, for as a planar antenna so now uh, this is a, a quarter wave monopole antenna. This is a array of quarter wave monopole antenna. This is an array of parabolic dish which can enhance the gain for satellite uh, art station. It can be useful. And um, this is a BTS transmitting antenna. And uh, it can be consisting of either vertical or horizontal or cross dipoles. And nowadays, some uh, printed antennas are also useful. And uh, in this tower also, you can see several antennas are there uh, just to avoid the, uh, the um, multiple fading. This is called antenna diversity. So <laughs> this is the basic antenna diversity system means if it is a transmitter, if it is a receiver, there will be two types of signal. One is the direct ray and another red ray is basically the ground reflected ray. And here the direct signal is reflected yellow one, you can understand from this picture. Here you see the receiving antenna is receiving the signal from direct path as well as ground reflected path. The phase difference between this direct path and the ground reflected path uh, may be sometimes 180 degree, therefore nullify the reception at this antenna. So definitely this path difference will not be similar for this yellow color. So it will receive then. So this is basically the space type diversity. So you are spatially shifting the, your antenna position so that the path difference due to the um, path, uh, phase difference due to path difference can be gained. So this is basically the diversity. And uh, before going uh, to antenna uh, sensors, we need to uh, see the uh, <coughs> the frequ different frequency range also very brief because um, the frequency ranges are very much important. Um, some work we were seeing, whenever we are trying to uh, see the um, uh, underground wireless sensor network, we have seen that the frequencies uh, should be very low. The frequency, the high frequency is not working. High frequency is not working and um, the frequency should be very low. And uh, here, so that is why we need to have one uh, brief idea about the range of frequency like we can understand low frequency and very low frequency this is for um, telegraphy and long distance uh, communication uh, for marine navigation also vertical grounded antenna mainly monopole and dipole are the very much popular and very important antennas with that it can be possible another is the medium frequency that is for broadcasting and navigation purpose high frequency which is broadcasting and long distance communication and uh, then very high frequency is also there, which is land mobile communication. Once you are coming to UHF 300 to uh, 3000 megahertz, this is a short distance communication. Um, uh, for radar ILS line of sight communication, it is there, but more uh, useful line of sight communication is SHF, which is 30 to 30 gigahertz range, which is called microwave range. Aperture antenna, reflector, horn antennas, slot antennas are the typical antenna, but printed microstrip antennas are also working in this range. Okay. However, I'm not talking about beyond 20 gigahertz because beyond 20 gigahertz, your printed antenna becomes very small. So there will be very much Spurious radiation, so this is under the area of research. How we can uh, prepare the millimeter wave antennas for uh, as a planar antenna? So, uh, most useful modern antennas are basically the planar antennas, and it works in 1 to 20 gigahertz part of a microwave. And all the mobile antennas are either microstrip, printed loop, printed UWB monopole, or PIFA antennas. Now, uh, the one thing also you need to know, just uh, I'm sharing the example that whenever uh, we try to work with uh, wireless sensor network underground, so we saw that the um, uh, and, uh, frequency should be uh, very low. 
and the low frequency around 430 megahertz like that uh, so actually whenever um, we are working with the underground uh, what happens if we are using a very high frequency your uh, ground is no longer acting as a very good conductor instead it is a quasi conductor or you may think it as a dielectric also but dielectric with a very high loss tangent okay so it is a bad dielectric in conductive properties are there so because of high loss tangent the signal will be absorbed within the ground and therefore uh, the high frequency cannot be uh, good for uh, this underground sensor network so you should uh, have some frequency concepts also when you try to work with the antennas and these are the some planar antenna examples and here you can see this is a meander line antenna and uh, this meander line its back side this is a patch antenna and uh, some here there is a comb type comb shape type um, patch antenna and uh, some others also you can see the dipole antenna printed dipole antenna like that this is a simple dipole but uh, generally now the this uh, printed dipole has been uh, taken up the shape of uh, some vivaldi type antenna which is having a very wide bandwidth so now <laughs> what is the antenna antenna is basically it is converting your electrical signal to the radio waves so here in this region some transmitting transmission line or feeder lines are there these are uh, fed to the antenna element and antenna element certain current distribution takes place and because of certain current distribution the fields are converted to the wireless radio wave and when it is coming to the radio wave it becomes a field quantity however behind the antenna there is a electrical quantity okay so in order to match this electrical quantity and the field quantity some fictitious parameters also we introduce like radiation resistance like thing and uh, these uh, space quantities are cons consisting of different field patterns um, power pattern directivity gain polarization etc so now <coughs> the uh, general field pattern is having uh, different types of lobes the one is the main beam this is called the major lobe this is the main beam and these are the secondary maxima when you, you have uh, seen the optics physical optics we have said that uh, um, one primary maxima along with that some secondary maxima are also there which are due to uh, accidental phase matching of some of the sources so these uh, lobes are the side lobes these side lobes are basically the secondary maxima while this is the primary maxima it is called major lobe these are the called side lobes <laughs> out of these side lobes the lobes which are occurring at plus minus pi in this region so these are called back lobes all right so uh, except the major lobe all of the lobes means side lobes or the back lobes these are called uh, basically the um, minor lobes okay and the level of minor lobe is expressed as ratio of power density in the lobe to uh, in the main lobe to the uh, side lobe that is side lobe ratio we generally call it as SLR. So directivity and gain is the parameter which is basically the ratio of power radiated by an antenna in its direction of maximum radiation to the power radiated by reference antenna in the same direction. It is measured in dBi or dBd. Okay. So uh, suppose if you are um, thinking that the, you are having a spherical football type balloon so if you square squeeze it from the uh, lower side and it will be extended in the forward direction so how much extension is taking place then its average value that is basically the directivity and this directivity is basically um, referred as dbi or dbd means reference with the dipole or reference with isotropic source um and the uh, feed point impedance is also a very important parameter this is uh, the impedance measured at the input of the antenna the real part of this input impedance is the sum of radiation and loss resistance and the imaginary part of this impedance represent the uh, power temporarily stored by antenna that is the reactive part now uh, in general whenever you will see resistance profile you will find that like this 
So uh, at the resonance, uh, this register, um, uh, this is the resistive part, and the red is basically the reactive part. This re resistive part should be matched with your feeder line, and the reactive part should be zero. However, we will find that some reactive part is there at the input point of the feeder line. So uh, that is basically in case of dipole lantern, it is around inductive in nature and it is around 42.5 ohm and for uh, monopole it is 36 ohm it's half and um, uh, sorry 21 ohm it's half uh, and this uh, uh, for the dipole antenna because of the nature this is basically an open circuit a transmission line but because of the modification of structure the input impedance of open circuited line which we generally which is in our uh, mindset that is uh, it is a, a minus jz 0 40 beta l it slightly shifts towards the left left side in the impedance diagram and then uh, you will find that uh, there is a um, when the length of the antenna is lambda by two means this is equivalent to open circuited transmission line of uh, length lambda by four uh, then its input impedance carries some inductive part also it is not passing through zero and that inductive part is around 42.5 ohm so that is why that inductance comes into play now what is the beam width Beam width also, you know, that is, um, uh, if uh, this is the direction of maximum radiation, if you are coming down here where the power becomes half from year to year, so half power means in dB scale it is 3 dB. So this angular separation is basically called as 3 dB beam width. And uh, this angular separation is 3 dB beam width or half power beam width. Uh, and uh, beam width is the angular separation of half power points of the radiated beam. This is the half power beam width. Uh, other than uh, another thing is there that is the beam width between first nulls when the nulls are occurring. Um, uh, so the angular separation between the nulls is basically the beam width between first null. And when the antenna length increases, antenna dimension increases, the beam becomes narrower. Uh, so this is the 3D pattern of a simple dipole antenna. Uh, and is basically the direction of maximum. So if you come down, uh, come up or down by half power point, means by 3 dB in dB scale, beam width, and this is for uh, the radiation pattern and uh, definitely whenever you are working for antenna sensor you need to use a simple antenna so this is of good choice this half wave dipole antenna is a good choice for antenna sensor and uh, this is for three lambda by four monopole antennas so why we are seeing know from which direction i need to sense the signal with, from which direction I need to sense different antennas. So whenever it is um, along the sky, so if you use, uh, suppose it is at slightly elevated region, you want to sense something, you should not use this dipole antenna where the lobes are elevated towards a higher angle here, you can see, so you should use that part. Definitely, you need to take care of uh, these regions because these creates uh, some thin issues. Uh, uh, you need to know the radiation pattern to choose the antenna which will be acting as a sensor. So uh, now, when the um, you you will mount the antenna for sensing. So you have to mount it at a proper height because you cannot uh, put it uh, in any place because uh, the input resistance or radiation resistance changes. And if it is very close to the ground at that time, it uh, there is an oscillation between 100 ohm to 60 ohm. But the, ultimately, it is fixed up. Generally, it is kept that uh, it is uh, in our knowledge uh, we generally keep the antenna um, uh, around uh, one wavelength uh, higher uh, from the ground. Uh, this is for um, you mounting the antenna. Then the coming to the polarization. 
polarization is basically the direction of electric field and is same as the physical attitude of the antenna. I mean to say that if we are keeping the antenna vertical, then um, the electric field is coming out vertically, so it is a vertically polarized antenna. If it is uh, uh, kept at a horizontally um, horizontal direction, uh, horizontally, if we, it is mounted, then electric field is coming out horizontally, so that is a horizontally polarized antenna. So uh, when you want to receive and transmit uh, the antenna, the polarization should be same. Otherwise, it cannot uh, receive because it, it is based on E dot DL, this issue. So therefore, uh, the polarization should be matched. And the, another thing is that the bandwidth, that is the range of frequency over which one or more antenna um, parameters, they stay in a certain tolerable range. Importance of grounds are basically the ground plane is definitely needed without ground antenna cannot be there. So it can increase the directivity, it can modify the radiation characteristics and for impedance matching purpose, the ground plane is severely important and there are several research work which has been done to modify the ground plane just for impedance matching purpose. And the ground conductivity can be increased, uh, can be improved by using uh, the ground radial system also. That is the counterpoise, means uh, uh, some radial wads which can simulate the ground plane, but it is definitely uh, suitable for uh, uh, your low frequency work. For work with antenna sensor, that is the reflection coefficient. The most important parameter by which the center sensor antenna works in most of the cases, that is the uh, reflection coefficient. This parameter is very important. It is the signature of um, uh, input impedance of the antenna and it depends on matching between the feeder line and the antenna. Some physical changes, some physical changes which we want to sense using the sensor antenna, it affects severely this reflection coefficient. So therefore, by studying the reflection coefficient characteristics um, uh, for um, uh, sensing something, some physical changes. So it is very important to know this reflection coefficient for this purpose. And uh, it is popularly known as S11 characteristics and it must be below minus 10 dB for proper working of antenna. And we know that the reflection coefficient is basically the antenna impedance minus the feeder line impedance. ZA minus ZF by ZA plus ZF. So if I do it, this is the voltage reflection coefficient. So 20 log 10 gamma is minus 10 dB. We consider which gives us gamma is equal to 0 0.3. So if we calculate the SWR 1 plus mod gamma by 1 minus mod gamma, it comes as 1.85, which is less than 2. It is well known to the um, uh, microwave engineers that whenever we are working with some uh, transmission line or waveguides or antenna, the SWR should be less than two. So uh, that is why minus 10 dB is generally considered, but nowadays some, sometimes minus six dB is also considered. So this is a typical reflection coefficient curve. Uh, so here you see this is minus 10 dB. So here you see from, from 401 megahertz to 406 megahertz, it comes below 10 dB. So this is the bandwidth of your antenna. This is the bandwidth of your antenna and where your, uh, the tip of the S11 minima means the uh, lowest value of S11 minima, this is the resonant frequency. Uh, so basically the in this resonant frequency and the bandwidth is from 401 megahertz to 406 megahertz and any variation of this reflection coefficient uh, can be uh, uh, can be attributed to the uh, change in uh, some physical change i need to know i i should say that if you suppose you are uh, connecting your uh, for the measurement purpose you are connecting your uh, antenna uh, with vna uh, any port and uh, you can check it uh, whenever you will work with it you will see that the s11 characteristics is like that so whenever you are put some uh, put something obstacle any conducting material you put the hand just in front of antenna you will see that this s11 um, profile it will move up Okay, it will move up. It will not uh, going up to minus 20 dB. It can be minus 15 like that. So this changes is basically, uh, it is basically sensing uh, any conducting body is in front of your antenna or not. 
So this fact may be useful to sense any conductor in between transmitting and receiving antenna. Now microstrip patch antenna gains very popularity because it is having the established theory and whenever um, there will be a need of patch production, we need to go for the microstrip patch antenna of rectangular and circular geometry. This is a well-known planar antenna and um, yeah, you can uh, see that uh, it was basically introduced by Jams in 1953 and after that 1970, 1972 in a gradual manner it has been developed and in this microstrip antenna the uh, several advantages i think all will know this that is the lightweight planar configuration easy to fabricate low fabrication cost easy to feed coaxial cable and easy to use in an array you can just print it uh, one after another so it will form an array on the chassis of dielectric material but it is having some severe disadvantages also narrow bandwidth poor polarization purity low gain etc for which the several uh, researchers are going on in order to um, uphold the quality of quality characteristics of the antenna so I'm, I'm not going uh, into that part uh, because this comes under the planar antenna characteristics in spite of all these limitations microstrip path antenna researchers are continuously trying to improve its characteristic and widely investigated geometry is rectangular and circular <laughs> rectangular microstrip patch antenna basically uh, the antenna which is uh, resonating of this shape when the length is smaller and w is higher and it is feeding along this uh, direction so then it will excite tm10 mode it will excite TM10 mode where the fringing fields are basically these things. These are the vertical fields, uh, that is the red color field. This is basically called co polarization field, and this is the wanted polarization. And however, this blue color horizontal, this is the orthogonal polarization. Definitely, this is not desirable uh, when the antenna is exciting TM10 mode. Okay. So this orthogonal polarization always is there, which is called cross polarization. Several researchers are also going on to reduce this cross polarized radiation, but we are not going into that. But you need to know for EM10 mode, the resonance is going on along the longitudinal direction, along the length of the patch. And uh, for TM, uh, another mode uh, is there, which can also be used as fundamental mode, that is TM01 mode. So in TM01 mode, the resonance will be along the width of the patch and at the time that will be TM01 mode. Okay. So in that case, this vertical field, fringing fields will not be taking part in radiation, rather the horizontal fringing field will be the taking part in radiation. In some issues are there where TM10 and TM01 mode simultaneously to be excited in order to achieve the circular polarization or in some case of sensor antenna also this uh, sometimes it is needed that tm10 and tm01 both to be simultaneously excited now uh, tm01 mode polarization is also linear but it is horizontal as i explained in our earlier slide a microstrip antenna can radiate well even if with a thin substrate because of its resonance whenever we are working with the um, a very thin substrate uh, the resonance is very strong and that is why there is no such problem and it can uh, radiate well this is the um, basic in case of phone there is a planar antenna you can see here it can be a pipa antenna and uh, this is also another antenna which can be mounted on the aircraft uh, so this is a typical measurement setup for uh, antennas. Um, however, this is not uh, in a proper position. It is basically rotating from left side to, uh, from upside to in this direction. It is rotating in a clockwise direction in an intermediate stage. This photograph has been taken. So this is a typical measurement setup. And um, here, different geometries of printed antennas are there, uh, circular, annular, triangular. And this is the rectangular one. Now, whenever we are coming to the uh, design issues, means we have talked about the S11 characteristics and the lowest value of S11 minima, which can be obtained at the resonant frequency curve as well as in the Smith chart plot. Uh, so there you can find that the resonant frequency is uh, can be calculated from here. Okay. 
So this is the resonant frequency uh, thing, and this is the input impedance thing, input impedance formulation. These formulation you should know, otherwise you cannot know where there will be the S11 dip. So where is the frequency? Whenever you are trying to design a sensor antenna, you need to know at what frequency will work with. So for that, these design formulations are required. Now we are coming to the concept of planes. Two principal planes are there. You can see. Uh, so if this is a, a radiating patch antenna, so one is vertical plane. Vertical plane means if you look at this coordinate system, that is the exact plane. And another is the horizontal plane, which is called the YZ plane. Okay. So electric lines are basically along the XZ plane. So this XZ plane is basically the E plane, while YZ plane is basically the H plane. Okay. So E plane and H plane, these are XZ and YZ respectively. These two are the principal planes. Any antenna is having the principal planes. So principal plane patterns, we generally, uh, we are taking interest. However, the 3D pattern is also very important. So this is a typical radiation pattern of a radiating patch. So which you are seeing at the upside means where the markers are given. So these are the copolar radiation pattern means these are the wanted polarization. What I said that if your length is smaller, W is larger, uh, then W by L is basically greater than one. And when it is the case at the time, your antenna must excite. If you are feeding it along the length, it must excite TM10 mode. And in TM10 mode, if you go back that, uh, you go back to your earlier uh, slide here, for TM10 mode, we can see that the field lines are vertical. So these are the basically making the copolar radiation, but some erratic, Horizontal radiation takes place in spite of uh, it is excited with TM10 mode. Some horizontal that is called cross polar radiation. So that thing you can get it here. So these two are the copolar radiation and these lower ones are cross polar radiation. Researchers are going on to suppress this cross polar radiation. Uh, so uh, the, here, why there are two graphs? Because I have told that two planes are there. One principal plane is called E plane. Another principal plane is called H plane. So E and H corresponding planes are there. And uh, as such, this blue color line, if you can recognize from this uh, slide, this blue color line, which is a broader beam, that is a E plane pattern. And uh, this uh, brown color, uh, reddish color, that is the H plane pattern. And here, this is the H plane cross pole. This is the E plane cross pole. This cross pole means the unwanted horizontal polarization. And then as sensing element for crops, so keeping the gain and pattern fixed, change in transmitted and received power may contain useful information. Suppose you are having certain uh, physical thing to sense. So at the time, if you know the antenna gain and the pattern, and if you know the uh, loss factor, then you can easily sense the some object. Okay. So keeping the gain and the pattern fixed, change in transmitted and received power to the antenna may contain useful information. How? The two-way propagation loss factor is also there because it must be considered then the rest attenuation of the power. Definitely whenever you are transmitting certain signal, certain DBM and the received uh, signal DBM, it is uh, definitely lower than your transmitted power. So this, how it is getting lower. So for to and pro movement, there will be the propagation loss. And once propagation loss is there, then uh, the loss factor will also comes into play. Uh, so because of loss factor, there will be some attenuation and the rest part will be the uh, rest part will be the attenuation from the object. Suppose a ripe potato, uh, if we want to see whether the potato is ripe or uh, it is not yet um, mature. So uh, for ripe potato, water content must be more. 
than some unripe potato means which is not matured the water content is less when the potato is getting big at that time the water content is more therefore the electromagnetic wave which is basically moving towards the potato and after getting uh, there some portion is absorbed and then it is reflected back so at the time what happens the attenuation within the water content within the potato so that also take care uh, that also matters so from there you can sense that whether your potato has been matured or not so it can be in this way the antenna can be used as a sensor now <coughs> Mm, uh, antenna can be used as a strength sensor also. Uh, you see that uh, two, uh, two uh, very uh, first modes are TM10 and TM01. As I told that when um, uh, W is larger, at that time TM10 mode is the smaller one, that is the uh, lowest order dominant mode. But whenever W is less, L is higher, at that time TM01 mode is having uh, TM01 mode comes into play. Uh, so now the thing is that um, the resonant frequency for them is for 10 mode is this one, for 01 mode that is this one. Now FTM10 that is a function of length from your equation you can see, while TM01 it is a function of width. Okay, so any change in length and width affects TM10 and TM01 mode respectively. So for TM10 mode, electric surface current along the longitudinal, longitudinal means along the length of the patch and the ground plane it flows. However, for TM01 mode, electric surface current, uh, the electric surface current, which this will not flow along the length, along the longitudinal direction, rather it will flow along the uh, lateral direction, that is the width of the patch. So for TM01 mode, it depends on um, electric surface current along the width. So any variation from this discussion, it is understood that any variation along the length, it will affect TM10 mode and any variation along the width, it will affect TM01 mode because they are basically TM10 mode is a function of length, TM01 mode resonant frequency is a function of width. Now, suppose an antenna uh, for strength sensor or crack detection, ground crack detection is required. So at that time, um, if you see that, what I said earlier, if your W is smaller than your length at that time, TM10, uh, if your um, yeah, TM10 mode is here, TM01 mode is uh, higher. Means here, um, depending on W by L ratio, it can be this zero one mode can come before this or can go this, but that is not an issue here for antenna as a sensor. Two nearby modes, uh, which are the which are uh, nearly a fundamental type mode, uh, which depends on length and width, two dimension of a rectangular patch. These are uh, TM10 and TM01, their frequencies are there. Suppose uh, you are uh, basically giving a strain towards the length of the patch. Toward the length of the patch, at the time when the some strain is given, there is a length variation. There is a length deformation and variation. So definitely, as the resonant frequency of one zero mode depends on the length, so it will affect this resonant frequency dip. All right, and whenever any strain is applied along W. So at that time, which one will be affected? This TM01 will be affected because this is dependent. This is a function of W. That is the width of the patch and this is the function of length of the patch. Okay. And the resonant frequency of this is also function of length of patch. The resonant frequency of this is function of width of the patch. Now, whenever we are using uh, antenna uh, as a strain sensor, assuming a strain epsilon is applied along the length direction of the radiation patch. So whenever some strain is applied, the electrical length of the antenna patch under the strain epsilon uh, can be calculated as one plus epsilon L0. So effective length has become like this. Due to Poisson's effect, uh, uh, this, uh, this electrical width and uh, substrate height will also be changes, which will be according to this. 
okay now this mu p and mu s these are the poisons ratio of antenna patch and substrate material okay so you see le w e h these are changing okay so if that is changing definitely your resonant frequency which is a function of length or width so it will be changing so it will be shifted your resonant frequency suppose your l becomes larger what will happen so in the denominator it is larger means em10 will become smaller so it will shift in the lower side of the spectrum so whenever you will see that uh, this tf the resonant frequency of 10 it will be uh, shifted towards this side means towards the lower side of the spectrum so by seeing that you can um, uh, understand that there is a strain along the length and uh, if you calculate the change in resonant frequency what i said here that if uh, the, this is the original resonant frequency before applying the strain after applying the strain uh, suppose it has been shifted by like this here okay so difference between the changed position and its normal position without strain is delta f10 and delta f resonance by f resonance means delta f10 by f resonance this is basically when you calculate it will be coming to c epsilon where c is the negative constant okay so the variation of resonant frequency delta f resonance c epsilon f resonance means this is a equation of a straight line so it is linearly varying all right so if c is a negative constant so resonant frequency will also uh vary and resonant frequency depending on the vary uh, variation of resonant frequency you can compute how much strain it is uh, suffering so based on equation which we have uh, shown here um this is this is a equation of a line uh, so applied strain epsilon is linearly proportional to the normalized antenna frequency shift delta f resonance by f resonance and uh, similar to conventional metal film strain gauge the antenna strain sensor is also sensitive to temperature fluctuation temperature compensation should uh, also be implemented like other sensors in this case so um, some here you can get that the antenna can be used as a strain sensor in this way here you see uh, suppose there is a simple patch antenna when the there is a strain applied along the length suppose it is uh, you see it, it is fed from both the sides in this side and in this side okay so whenever it is fed along both the sides it can excite both the modes tm10 and tm01 so that is why two things are there okay you you, you see the s11 curve uh, either 10 and 01 both frequencies are excited okay so whenever there is no strain at that time the red color graph is there okay red color graph is there whenever this is for tm10 mode frequency s11 for tm10 this is s11 for tm01 now whenever the strain is applied along the length which will be affected i have told that tm10 mode is a function of length its frequency is a function of length so whenever you are applying strain here the length changes will be there so tm10 will be affected this black curve has come up okay however uh, there is no change along the width and therefore the 01 this red color and black color are the coincident graph here so that is why you cannot see but here it is slightly separated that is why we can resolute it okay so there is a delta f resonance comes up okay so in a similar manner if the shear has been given in strains as a strain is given along the width then we would have seen that this is not changing however this will be changing so depending on changing uh, depending on the notation depending on the change of s11 profile reflection coefficient profile you can understand that um, uh, in the in which direction strain has been applied and from our earlier uh, things from here you can find out how much strain is uh, applied there so this is antenna uh, uh, as a strain sensor now antenna for ground plane crack sensor now whenever a crack is uh, uh, given in the ground plane of the antenna 
when the crack is given at the ground plane it will force the current to flow around it means the current suppose here if you look at uh, look this uh, figure this is l and this is w and this along the length of the current is flowing through the patch as well as through the ground okay so whenever there is a ground crack the current will flow like this okay so it will elongate the electrical length of the patch and therefore the resonant frequency changes all right so when the crack is like this it will changes the length dimension okay so whenever the crack is like this in this direction in this direction if the crack is there then what would happen i need to excite em01 mode to see how much to investigate that crack because at that time current should flow in this direction and because of crack it should move like this it should move like this the change of tm01 mode all right so whenever the crack is like that tm10 mode frequency s11 characteristics will be affected however tm01 mode will not be affected so crack in the ground plane will force the current to flow around it as a result the effective electric the length of the patch and the increases which shifts the antenna resonant frequency towards the lower well the effect of crack on the resonant frequency uh, of the patch antenna is dependent on crack orientation crack perpendicular to the patch length direction <coughs> will definitely crack which is along the patch length it will not change tm10 mode but it, it can change tm01 mode okay so tm10 mode will be unaffected like that so on the other hand tm01 uh, 01 current is not affected and thus f0 a01 frequency remains the same clearly a crack perpendicular to the weak direction then f01 will be affected means tm01 mode will be affected while 10 mode will not affected so whenever we are using a slanted crack suppose if there is a crack which is in a slanted version that means i mean to say it is neither horizontal nor vertical at the time you need to keep in your mind your antenna should excite both the modes tm10 and tm01 and both should be changed because horizontal crack uh, the slanted crack is having certain horizontal uh, version as well as certain vertical version so the current will be in both both direction it will be affected and therefore uh, your both the modes to be uh, uh, studied that how much in so the amount of frequency shift depends on the crack dimension underneath the radiation patch you can also understand the la because uh, as if the crack dimension is larger or crack dimension is smaller accordingly your current path will be deviated accordingly the patch will be lengthened or it will be lengthened more or less okay so depending on the frequency depending on that the frequency shift occurs so uh, with that frequency shift you can understand whether the crack is of larger dimension or small dimension both the crack growth and crack orientation can be detected by monitoring the antenna resonant frequency shift any crack is there if uh, you see that the uh, without crack if the um, uh, resonant frequency is something and with crack which resonant frequency is shifted whether 10 mode s11 or 01 mode s11 depending on that you can make the orientation of the crack then how much shifting is taking place it depends on the crack dimension so it you can get the idea from there also so uh, crack induced antenna frequency shift usually is much larger than the strain or temperature induced antenna frequency shift as such it is unlikely to miss the crack presence due to the normal strain temperature fluctuations other radiation characteristics of the antenna sensors such as directivity or radiation pattern may help to differentiate between different types of cracks okay so <coughs> in these cases suppose in the <coughs> in the time of uh, sensing the crack uh, in the ground plane we need to use the planar antenna in a different way we do not then at that time we will not use a uh, 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 artificial ground plane which we generally used to use uh, so that we will not use rather we will put it on the uh, conducting material where we are trying to uh, sense the crack right so that will be acting as a ground plane okay 
So that is for ground plane sensor. This is the uh, wireless interrogation of antenna sensor. For antenna sensor, wirelessly it can be interrogated. Uh, uh, see here the interrogation antenna. Here there is one setup. Transmitting signal is provided by uh, the horn antenna, and this is another uh, antenna which is a planar antenna. See. Uh, micro patch antenna it is connected to a FET general JFET and there is a photo cell okay so there is a light is there so when the light is not there when this light is not there then what happens this uh, yeah, there is a uh, drain to source channel so the short termination is taking the reflection is less so definitely this uh, will be connected to a receiver and light uh, is on that they cut if the connection is cut it is isolated okay so at that time it cannot receive anything whatever signal will be coming it is being reflected back so this reflected back signal these are called the back scattered signals okay back scattering can be possible due to the structure in any antenna back scattering always happens but if the uh, antenna is not receiving at all then the back scattering will be definitely more okay so one is antenna mode backscattering, another is because of this fate, another backscattering will be there. Okay, so this thing, uh, the antenna sensor is connected to a drain terminal of a JFET, which serves as a microwave switch controlled by solar cell. When no light is uh, falling on the solar cell, the fate has a zero gate source voltage. As such, the source and drain terminals of the fate are connected, shorting fates, source uh, terminal to ground creates a short termination for antenna sensor. <clears throat> when the light is shown on the solar cell, then there will be a VGS, so there will be pinch off in the channel, so antenna will be getting cut from the connection. Since the antenna is, then it will be basically the open termination. Since the antenna signal is reflected at these two different termination, have 180 degree phase shift, one is the short termination, another is the open termination. The antenna modes backscattering will be cancelled if we uh, co co compare it and subtract it, then the antenna mode backscattering will be cancelled, whatever backscattering will be due to that light, okay, so because of this light. So here this is the, uh, some DSP unit will also be needed and from there we can, uh, this is the mechanism here and um, Printed antenna sensor design. Now the design issues, the fabrication of the antenna sensor starts with machining the radiation patch, which can be done with in several ways. The easiest and least uh, precise way is to cut the um, patch foil, means metallic foil, uh, metallic foil with the sharp blade or scissor. And once the radiation patch is uh, machined, it can be glued on Kapton film or in general, we will uh, see that for microstrip antenna, we generally with a rigid substrate, we work like artidoid uh, FR4 like that. But for antenna as a sensor, it should be, um, uh, it, it is generally um, a flexible substrate, okay. So Kapton film is a flexible. Uh, so alternatively, antenna patch can be directly fabricated on the Kapton plane using lithographic microfabrication process. The antenna patch Kapton subassembly can be bonded in a structure directly in case of the structure under monitoring conductive material. What I have said already, since the antenna sensor are constructed from the film materials, these are flexible. That I have already said. Now, uh, printed antenna as a temperature sensor. You see. Uh, the resonant frequency of uh, your uh, 10 DM10 mode that is basically mm, uh, that is basically C by 2L root over XLNR. So if we are finding this, then it, uh, it can be decomposed into two component. Out of that, if individually you can, if 10 is with you, so you can calculate this one and this one. These are like this, and if you put these two here, then it becomes like this. Okay. So it is in a more simplified way, one is the variation of epsilon R, another is the variation of L. We are trying to see how the printed antenna can be used as a temperature sensor. Okay, so both epsilon R and the length L are the function of temperature. You see, 
when the uh, temperature changes epsilon r also changes and the, when the uh, temperature changes length also changes okay so uh, for the purpose of temperature sensing we can select a substrate whose normalized dielectric constant changes linearly proportional to temperature change if alpha epsilon is the thermal coefficient of dielectric constant so del epsilon er by epsilon r is equal to i can write epsilon alpha epsilon delta t okay so this uh, this function this function we are using like this okay so this is basically the thermal coefficient of uh, dielectric constant of the substrate now if we are coming to the length of the patch with the temperature because of uh, thermal coefficient of thermal expansion you all know it can changes so it is considered as del l by l is alpha t del t so these two if we can put in the equation here which we have got here we can get the relation like this so you see these are the constant factor we are writing it as kt delta t so variation of the resonant frequency is proportional to your temperature so kt is defined as the temperature sensitivity of the normalized frequency shift temperature sensitivity kt is determined by the thermal coefficient of dielectric constant of substrate as well as the coefficient of thermal expansion of the sensor uh, therefore change in resonant frequency carry the signature of the change in temperature now <clears throat> we are coming to the flexible antenna sensors so in flexible antenna sensors uh, already um, in the earlier yesterday's session i think uh, professor l dalit kumar singh sir he has given the flexible antenna structures so these things are um, uh, uh, widely uh, um, uh, given as a lecture in the last day. So I'm not going into the depth of that. Just I am giving the outline. Various flexible variable antenna sensors are implemented on different type of material. Uh, so cellulose filter paper, uh, graphene film, etc. Out of that, graphene has attractive, uh, attracted a uh, very much interest in variable communication. Uh, it is having some uh, very good electronic properties. And uh, due to the bending of flexible substrate, S11 characteristic changes. S11 characteristic changes means um, uh, with a PET substrate, I have seen uh, that the uh, resonant frequency S11 characteristics moves up. Okay, otherwise resonant frequency shifts. Uh, so due to bending of flexible structure, resonant characteristics will differ, uh, which is proportional to bending. And the antenna sensors with flexible substrate is a good choice for RFID antenna. Different efforts has been given. This is the last slide. And here um, you can see that different efforts has been given. Means I am leaving this dipole antenna case. So here all these cases, planar antennas have been useful. So here they have determined in these research papers, if you are, uh, I have not given here the references, if you search it in the Google, you can get it. Uh, so with the uh, planar patch antenna, the strain, sweat of a, um, a person, blood glucose level, temperature, NACL uh, uh, solution. So all these things uh, can be done with the, uh, 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 with the working with a planar patch antenna as a sensor different frequencies are given the material as a substrates are different that is in case of a strain someone has done with carbon filter paper uh, carbon and some with filter paper uh, for blood glucose textile has been useful for temperature textile has been used for nacl also polyvinyl has been used and um, uh, this type of uh, material uh, has been used and uh, after that um, uh, the, what is the change in the antenna parameter in all the cases mainly the frequency shift except in this case here for blood glucose level it is found that specific absorption rate so last day uh, it is told the sar value is there there is a specific value that means how much absorption is um, tolerable uh, by the human cell so this specific absorption rate will be uh, changing otherwise in all the cases it is found that the frequency shift is very much important that is why i told that the reflection coefficient characteristics or s11 characteristics you should know well uh, to work with the antenna sensor with this i am completing the presentation uh, thank you 
Thank you very much, sir, for your excellent informative uh, talk. So now I'll request the participant, if you have any question uh, or any queries, you can type it in the chat box or in the question answer section. Any participant having any doubt or any uh, question, you can uh, type your question in the chat box. Sir, there is one question mm. uh, from Professor A. Srinivas Rao. Yeah. Is it possible to integrate RF MEM switch with antenna? Yes, yes, it is possible. RF MEM switch uh, can be integrated with uh, planar antennas. As such, some works are also been done uh, for reconfigurable antenna uh, cases uh, where we need to shift uh, the frequency dynamically uh, from one to other at the time the RF MEM switch are useful. Any other question from the participants? Okay, if there is no other question, uh, uh, then I will uh, I will request my colleague, Dr. Achinto Goiddo, to give formal vote up, uh, formal thanks for the session. Um, very, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Sunito Chattopadhyay for uh, this wonderful uh, presentation and uh, the, i think uh, all the participants have gathered uh, knowledge a good uh, amount of knowledge has gathered from the expert and uh, the, his experience in this antenna field is very high and uh, his uh, knowledge regarding this antenna and how we can use this for our sensing purpose the, the we today we got the, uh, the beginning knowledge from the, from him I think all the participants from this point, they can think about uh, how they can use for other applications also, how the antenna can be used, how antenna can be designed. So I thank very much uh, for um, giving the, the such a wonderful lecture and um, thank you, sir. So I think uh, after this, I thank all the participants also to be with us. And I, uh, next session is from 2.15. Thank you. Thank you, Ajinto. So now we'll meet at 2.30 after lunch break.